Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 154, Leon Trotsky, 1905-1917. Last time, we covered the early years of Lev Bronstein and his conversion into the revolutionary Leon Trotsky. When we last met Trotsky, he was in Kiev, having come back from self-imposed exile. It is 1905, and Russia is roiling because of numerous events leading to revolts, protests, and strikes, crippling the country. The Russo-Japanese War is going poorly, and Russian police have killed hundreds of people during a peaceful protest on Bloody Sunday, January 6, 1905. While Lenin and Martov stayed away from Russia, fearing arrest if they returned, Leon had no such fear. While the others continued arguing about whether the Mensheviks or the Bolsheviks should lead the organization, Trotsky, at this point, thought that action was more important than ideologies, and he began to do what he did best, write. His letters and articles were being passed around all over the country. His popularity was growing. While Leon made it to St. Petersburg by spring, his wife, Natalia Sadova, was arrested. She was sent to prison for six months before being sent to Tver under police supervision. Trotsky knew his time in St. Petersburg was too dangerous, and he headed to Finland that summer. The pressure on Tsar Nicholas II was growing due to the unrest throughout the country, and in particular within the factories. Their growing Soviets, also known as councils, wanted changes and were calling for strikes until they were appeased. Then Nicholas proposed the creation of a Duma, or legislative body. But it was a sham. Sergei Witte said of it, it would be, quote, a monstrosity. It would be a body that would permit those in power to say, in effect, we'll always listen to what you have to say, but then we'll do as we please. It would have been, in his opinion, quote, a parliament with no more than consultative power and the invention of bureaucratic eunuchs. The liberals, led by Pavel Milyukov, were happy with the proposal. Their party, known as the cadets, believed that any change was good and that it was moving in the right direction. Trotsky thought it was a scam. His responses to the historian and professor Milyukov were sarcastic and scathing. He said of the development of a constitutional monarchy, quote, Such things, professor, are never achieved with the signing of a parchment. They take place on the street and are achieved through struggle. You were afraid of breaking with the Duma, because to you this constitutional mirage seems real in the dry and barren desert through which Russian liberalism has been waiting. To Trotsky, revolution and the total overthrow of the Tsar was the only way. Making small steps toward a more liberal government, in his opinion, was a total waste of time. In September, the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed, ending the Russo-Japanese War. Many within Russia viewed this as another sign that the Tsar was an ineffectual leader. Sergei Witte returned to Russia from the treaty signing and was not happy with what he saw. People throughout the empire were so dissatisfied that many were in open revolt. As he put it, quote, Revolution was beginning to break out into the open, with a government unable to act, crumbling in some places, and losing authority. In short, the cry was for the end of the regime. After a strike by the printers throughout the country, as well as railroad workers and some others, it seemed as though the Tsarist regime was about to tumble. Trotsky decided to return to St. Petersburg, where he made a speech at the Polytechnic Institute. His speech was legendary and made him a major figure in the revolutionary movement. He spoke to the Soviet of St. Petersburg, which by now had a membership of somewhere around 200,000. Trotsky was a representative of the Mensheviks, and there were some Bolsheviks in attendance, but they're not given much support here. The Tsar knew he was in trouble, so he had Witte write what is now known as the Constitutional Manifesto, which was released on October 17, 1905. It was thought that by giving in and making the Duma a true body with power, this would somehow mollify the population. It didn't work. The Soviet of St. Petersburg, with Trotsky as their vice chairman, rejected the manifesto. 
They were also appalled by the increase of pogroms against Jews, especially within the Pale of Settlement where they lived. For the next year, hundreds of pogroms were initiated, causing the lives of over 3,000 people. Nicholas II believed that 90% of the revolutionaries were Jewish, which was way, way overestimated. And as I said last podcast, from what we've seen in the records, it was probably about 25%. But this isn't really surprising, as Nicholas never seemed to have the ability to believe that he was responsible for any problems in the country. It had to be always somebody else's fault. When a plan was uncovered that the Black Hundreds, an ultra-conservative group of thugs, were going to carry out a pogrom right in St. Petersburg, the local Soviet armed themselves to protect the Jews in the city. This caused the pogrom to be called off to prevent violence in the capital. Trotsky began to write prodigiously, taking over a small Russian newspaper known as the Ruskaya Gazeta. It went from a circulation of about 30,000 to around 500,000 within a month. He competed with the Mensheviks Nachalo, which means beginning, and the Bolsheviks Novaya Zhinzhen, or New Life. Each of those had over 50,000 readers. So as you can see, revolution was still in the air. But much to the chagrin of the revolutionaries, Tsar Nicholas caved in to the demands of the St. Petersburg Soviet and granted political amnesty to many in the prisons, as well as continuing to ease up on censorship. This was not to last very long. Appeased for the moment, calls for another general strike went unheeded, so Prime Minister Witte, sensing a change in the mood, began to crack down with increased censorship and that's because he saw things were really calming down within St. Petersburg. So on December 3rd, 1905, he ordered troops to surround the Soviet. Trotsky told his followers to, quote, dismantle their revolvers rather than surrender them. Leon and the fellow leaders were promptly arrested and taken to the Kresty jail and then transferred to the Peter and Paul fortress. Conditions were actually pretty good, as Trotsky and his fellow revolutionaries were not locked up in cells. Uh, they could talk and read materials brought in from the outside. And so for the next 10 months, while awaiting his trial, he read quite a bit and wrote an important collection of essays on his theory of revolutions entitled The Balance and the Prospects, The Moving Forces of the Revolution. Trotsky attempted through this book to lay out the groundwork on how he believed a Marxist revolution could occur in a backward country like Russia, despite the conditions not following Karl Marx's theories. He did not think that Russia needed a developed capitalist system in order to bring upon revolt and afterwards a socialist society. When the trial commenced in September of 1906, Trotsky was to be the star of the proceedings. Despite being told by his attorneys to not say anything, he did, of course, the exact opposite. One of his quotes was, What we possess is not a national government, but an automaton for mass murder. I can find no other place for the machine of government that cuts into the pieces of the living flesh of our people. And if you tell me that the pogroms, the arson, the violence, if you tell me that all that has happened in Tver, Rostov, Kursk, if you tell me that Kishinev, Odessa, Bialystok, represent the form of government of the Russian Empire, then yes, then I recognize, together with the prosecution, that in October and November, we were arming ourselves against the form of government of the Russian Empire. Basically, what Trotsky was doing here was claiming self-defense, and that the only reason they were armed was to prevent a pogrom. Incredibly, there was proof at the time that he was actually right. The government, and in particular the Okrana, the Tsar's secret police, did indeed have plans to incite a pogrom there. The former director of police in St. Petersburg, one Lopukhin, was willing to testify to the fact, but the court would not allow him, as this would be terribly embarrassing to the Tsar. Angrily, the defendants left the courtroom and boycotted the rest of the trial. In absentia, they were found guilty of a number of crimes but not the most serious one, insurrection. If they had, they may have faced the death penalty. Instead, they were sentenced to life in exile in Siberia. 
Two months later, they were on their way with Trotsky knowing that he could not risk another stay there. So when he reached the small town of Berezov, he was helped by a local doctor who had him fake a case of sciatica. Quickly, he found a guide and escaped undetected. Instead of heading south, which most people would have looked at, they headed west, a treacherous and difficult way. But he eventually made it to a train station in the Urals, and finally to St. Petersburg to meet up with his wife and young boy, Lev. Staying only for a few days, he and his family made their way to Helsinki, where Lenin and Martov were there to greet him. He would not return to Russia until the spring of 1917. At this point, I want to shift gears for just a little bit and talk about the different perceptions of Trotsky. Some, like Joshua Rubinstein, believe that Leon was an admired man who may have rubbed some the wrong way, but he was genuinely really liked. Robert Service, in his biography, completely blows this idea up. He gives numerous references of letters and other communications that paint a picture of a vainglorious man who irritated the hell out of his revolutionary colleagues. Neither the Bolsheviks nor the Mensheviks seemed to like him, but they did feel he was a valuable asset to the movement. In reading a few of his speeches and articles, it is plain to see that Trotsky was quickly making a lot of enemies. One who he met during this time would be his arch-rival and eventual killer, Joseph Jugashvili, known to history as Stalin. In 1907, the Trotsky family headed to London to attend the Fifth Party Congress, where Leon called for unity amongst the factions. Well, Lenin was okay with this as long as they settled all their differences in his favor. The Mensheviks were the same. This is one of those times that Trotsky irritated everyone. Trotsky's newspaper, Pravda, which he took over in October 1908, was now the darling of the revolutionary movement, both outside and inside Russia. In it, he continued his call for unity, which enthralled the masses, but befuddled the leaders of the movements. Lenin, for his part, was jealous of its popularity, so he took the name for the Bolsheviks, naming Joseph Stalin as its editor. Outraged, Trotsky could do little and finally acquiesced to the takeover. At the time, there was regional wars going on, known as the First and then the Second Balkan Wars. Trotsky became a war correspondent for the Kievskaya Misl. In his later works, after he was exiled from Russia by Stalin, he would write that this time covering the war taught him much about military matters, which helped him when he was the head of the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. Again, we have differences of opinion here, with Robert Service being adamant that his time could not have taught him anything and that this is just another egotistical attempt by Trotsky to rewrite his life in better terms. In 1913, Trotsky would finally meet Stalin. The meeting went like this, according to Leon. Quote, Without a warning knock, the door suddenly opened and an unfamiliar figure appeared on the threshold. He was not very tall, thin, with a dark, gray, colorless face on which traces of smallpox could be seen. He carried an empty glass. Evidently, he had not expected to meet me, and there was nothing friendly in his expression. He made a guttural noise, which could have been taken as a greeting, went to the samovar, silently poured himself some tea, and silently stepped out. Trotsky was enjoying himself in Vienna, where he and his family had settled down, but things were to change dramatically, because on June 28, 1914, Gavrilo Princip was to kill Archduke Ferdinand, the assassination that was to ignite World War I. Being a Russian in Vienna was not a safe thing, so when word got to him on August 3rd, he knew he would have to find somewhere else to live, and fast. Abandoning years of writing and a lot of personal belongings, the family hightailed it out of the country three hours after hearing the news. They headed to Switzerland, where they met up with Nikolai Bukharin and Lenin. Here we see some major differences between the Bolsheviks and Trotsky. Whereas they wanted the Germans to destroy the Russian army and the Tsar, Leon was appalled by this and his nationalistic beliefs became known. He despised the Tsar, but loved his country, and couldn't understand how Lenin could take this point of view. 
But even though this was a major split, they began to understand each other better and saw the war as a way to incite more revolutions throughout Europe as people became disillusioned with the fighting and loss of life. Trotsky headed to France to continue his work as a war correspondent. He also restarted the newspaper Golos and renamed it Nasha Slovo, or Our Word. Here he takes a position as co-editor with Martov. He met some important people in Soviet history at the paper, like Vladimir Antonov Ovsenko, the man who led the assault on the Winter Palace in October 1917. Others included Solomon Lozovsky, Anatoly Lunacharsky, Alexandra Kolontai, and Ivan Maisky. Antonov Ovsenko and Lozovsky would be killed by Stalin, and Lunacharsky would lose most of his positions when Koba came to power, likely because of their time and friendship with Trotsky. In September of 1915, a number of socialists got together in the Swiss town of Zimmermann. Here, they wrote something famously known as the Zimmermann Manifesto, which called on workers to abandon their support for the war effort. Trotsky wrote the manifesto, which included this line, quote, The war has lasted for more than a year. Millions of corpses lie on the battlefields. Millions of men have been crippled for life. Europe has become a gigantic human slaughterhouse. All science, the work of many generations, is devoted to destruction. The most savage barbarity is celebrating its triumph over everything that was previously the pride of mankind. Russia by now was made aware of Trotsky's work as a correspondent in France and used diplomatic pressure with their allies to see if they could deport him back to his native country. Leon was scared and tried to find another country to go to. He was forcibly thrown out into Spain. The Spanish were no happier to see him and told him in no uncertain words that he needed to get out. After appealing to his socialist friends for help, Trotsky headed for the United States in New York City. Arriving on January 13, 1917, with Nicholas Bukharin already there, Trotsky began to make the rounds, speaking at socialist gatherings around the East Coast. He lived with his family in an apartment in the Bronx on East 164th Street and Stebbins Avenue. There he made some more enemies, but this time it was the waiters at the Triangle Dairy Restaurant. See, Trotsky didn't believe in tipping the waiters, as he put it, quote, Tipping was demeaning to the dignity of a working man and that a person should get a regular salary, enough to live on and not have to depend on tips. Well, after a while he was refused service, and once even had hot soup spilled on him. Well, while in America, the Germans began unrestricted submarine warfare, which outraged the people. Then the Zimmermann telegram, something totally different, came to light, which said that the Germans would help Mexico, quote, reconquer lost territory, in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. If they declared war, Trotsky knew he needed to leave America, but another earth-shattering event came to light, which sped things up. Tsar Nicholas II, after 304 years of Romanov rule, abdicated the throne on March 2, 1917. Heading back to Russia aboard the Norwegian liner, the Christiana Fjord, British officials in Halifax, Nova Scotia, arrested Trotsky and put him in a German prisoner of war camp in nearby Amherst. Here, he proved to be a troublesome prisoner, rallying the soldiers with revolutionary talk. By April 19th, because of protests in Russia, Trotsky was released and headed back with his family. He arrived in the renamed city of Petrograd on May 17th, two and a half weeks before the arrival of Lenin. He arrived in the same station as his revolutionary comrade would and was greeted boisterously by a workers group. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as we cover the last of the episodes on Trotsky and his role in the Russian Civil War, his ouster from power, his wanderings around the world, and his eventual assassination in 1914. Don't forget to drop by the blog site where you can, if you'd like to, make a donation, big or small, to keep the podcast going. I'm also going to ask if anybody has not 
going on to iTunes to rate the podcast, please do so. If we get a surge, it might boost the podcast listenership a bit, and that would really be appreciated. Also, join us on Facebook is, well, as you know, where you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So as always, Tasidania y Spasiva Bolshoya.